Most people write about photographs uh, as cultural icons of one sort or another. Uh, what we've forgotten, I could be wrong about this, my hunch is what we've forgotten is that photographs are connected to the physical world. I've done something very, very simple, but I don't really see it that often, is I've tried to recover that connection between a photograph and the world. It's not what I believe about the photograph. It's not about what I think I see in the photograph. It's a true investigation into the world in which the photograph uh, was taken. My book, Believing is Seeing, starts with two photographs from 1855 from the Crimean War. Uh, a British photographer, considered by many to be the first war photographer, Roger Fenton, uh, was sent to the Crimea, took many, many, many photographs. This pair of photographs are his two most famous uh, called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And this valley was named by British soldiers because uh, this was trench warfare, people lobbing cannonballs at each other. And here we see this barren landscape covered with cannonballs. And this is the beginning of my inquiry. The question is, which of them came first? There's really no indication uh, that one photograph came before the other. They're identical, virtually identical, except in one, uh, there are cannonballs on this road that bisects the picture, and the other, there are no cannonballs. And so it becomes an issue of posing. Did Fenton deliberately put the cannonballs on the road in order to pose uh, this picture? What makes an honest photograph? what makes a truthful photograph. Um, and we've all heard endless arguments about how photographs should be taken. There are journalistic debates. Uh, photographs shouldn't be posed. Uh, the photographer should touch nothing. They should observe at a distance. Um, I have a slightly different view Photographs are neither true nor false. The talking about the truth or falsity of a photograph is nonsense talk. Um, uh, truth and falsity is vested in language and how we use words with respect to the world, not photographs. Uh, I also have this view that all photographs are posed. In my piece on Roger Fenton, I give the example of an elephant that is standing just outside of the frame, uh, that sometimes a photograph can be posed because it excludes something, because of the absence of something. But you can never see the absence of something in a photograph. And isn't there always an elephant just outside the frame? A photograph, among other things, decontextualizes, I'll use the fancy word, it decontextualizes everything. You don't see above, you don't see below, you don't see to the left or to the right, you don't see before or after. You see this swatch of reality that has been two-dimensional reality that's been torn out of the fabric of the world. Um, and the only way we can know what we're looking at is to investigate. I have this conceit. I think that's probably the best way to describe it. That if you want to understand photography, if you want to understand the meaning of photographs, the best way to do it is to seize on little details and try to understand them as a way of addressing much, much, much larger questions about truth in photography, about the nature of posing, about uh, how we get a picture of the world from a photograph, all of those questions. So Susan Sontag had written, it's one of the last pieces of writing that she did, 
uh, an essay on the Abu Ghraib photographs uh, on regarding the torture of others. It appeared in the New York Times Magazine. And this is, of course, the line that I always take exception to. Uh, she said that the meaning of the Abu Ghraib photographs was obvious. Well, it's not so obvious. Uh, and part of what has fascinated me is no one ever bothered to talk to the people who took the photographs about why they took them, about the circumstances in which they were taken, as if somehow the photographs obviated the need for any further investigation. Uh, just look at the photographs. Why bother investigating further? Uh, this photograph, which is of Sabrina Harmon next to a corpse, smiling, thumbs up, was assumed to be a picture of the person who had committed the crime, or at least was deeply implicated. And it turns out that photograph and many of the other photographs, there were some 30 other photographs that were taken, forensic photographs, I don't know a better way to describe them, because she was documenting a crime that she had nothing whatsoever to do with. She had sneaked into this room and had been told a number of lies by her commanding officers. Uh, if anything, she was involved in a kind of investigative journalism. There's something amazing about iconic photographs because um, they've become iconic because they have a certain power over us. We see so many powerful things in them. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's the raising of the flag on uh, Mount Suribachi at Iwo Jima or the Fenton photographs in the Valley of the Shadow of Death uh, or the hooded man at Abu Ghraib. These are powerful photographs that have taken on meaning for literally tens if not hundreds of millions of people. Someone objected because I call the hooded man uh, the central figure from the Iraq war as if it was my fault. Somehow I had selected this photograph out among many, which of course I did not. It's a photograph probably seen by more people than any other photograph in history. Photograph that's taken on meaning in the United States and around the world. Um, we all have feelings about it as a photograph without knowing really anything more than just seeing the photograph itself or seeing it as a part of this series of photographs that came, uh, this series of photographs that came out of Abu Ghraib. Here's my, here's my question. Um, aren't you a little bit curious about what you're actually looking at? <laughs> Just a tiny little bit. <laughs>